G'day, it's Paul Rowe, the Outback Historian. I'm right here in the middle of Dubbo. <clears throat> Behind me you can see Bill Ferguson, his statue. Uh, civil rights campaigner from 1938. Started right here in Dubbo, in this street. And uh, when I was researching his story, uh, I found <clears throat> he was in partnership with a man called William Cooper down in Victoria. And uh, William Cooper was a very articulate man, <laughs> had a big white moustache and he looked very dignified, white hair, uh, a yorta yorta man from up on the Murray. And uh, I noticed when he made petitions to Parliament or spoke or wrote in the papers, he had a very articulate style. He was very, very formal almost, slightly biblical. And uh, I thought when I was reading it, I thought, man, Somebody has really trained this fellow as a leader because he wasn't just, you know, a, a street orator, but he was a man with real class, if you like. He could really speak and uh, put his case very carefully and very in a very dignified and polite manner, respectful but strong. And that made me think, I wonder who trained this fellow. There must be somebody who's kind of given him this leadership skill. And so... Tracking it back, I found this amazing story about an Indian man who rejoiced in the name of Thomas Shadrach James. And uh, he was a young Indian man, came to Australia in 1880, or a bit, bit earlier. <clears throat> he grown up in a poor family in India, in an uh, Indian family in Mauritius, an island off Africa, which was under British colonial rule they battled their way up from being indentured labourers to being, uh, his father was a, a translator for the British government and uh, also a teacher in the Anglican church there. Family issues and he left home, came to Australia on his own, arrived I think first in Tasmania, then came to Melbourne and applied for medicine at university there. And he must have been a pretty bright lad, apparently he spoke three languages but he got typhus and that made his hands shake and that made it impossible for him to become a surgeon. And so he's walking on the beach, Brighton Beach, which was sort of where the elite people went uh, in Melbourne and uh, feeling pretty disappointed and he heard some singing and he came across a group of Aboriginal people, Yorta Yorta people from up on the Murray River from a mission there called Maloga Mission, which had been built by Daniel Matthews and his wife as a safe zone, a, a, a haven for Aboriginal people because they were getting a terrible time and their numbers have been decimated by disease and by being shot or whatever. So they were sort of the survivors, if you like. <clears throat> but Daniel Matthews was a Christian man. Uh, his dad had been a slave trader, actually, who'd converted to Christianity and become a Methodist preacher. Came to Australia his two sons set up business in Echuca and uh, when they saw what was happening because they'd been uh, open to the abolitionist movement in England trying to free the slaves across the British Empire they were very offended by what they saw happening to the Aboriginal people and so they acted pretty strongly and this mission that they were conducting in Melbourne on the beach <laughs> in this elite sort of beach area I think was Daniel Matthews way of saying you know, these people are educatable. They aren't ignorant savages. Uh, they are people made in God's image. And they have a right uh, to be educated, to be accepted amongst us. Well, it struck uh, Thomas Shadrach James. He says in his own words, he said, the Lord spoke to me that, that night. And uh, he said himself, he put his hand up and said, I will be the teacher for those people up there in the mission. So he was. And for the next 40 years, that's what he did. He taught in a little tiny school up there on the on the Murray uh, at Malaga and then at Kamaragunga, which became quite a famous name. And uh, as his granddaughter said, he didn't just teach writing and reading, he taught writing and leading, uh, which was a very neat turn of phrase because that's exactly what he did. Education department people who came to check him found that his education levels were higher than the average and a lot of the white settlers would send their kids to his school as well 
He was a very gentle man, but very determined. He was the football coach, cricket coach, choir leader, preacher. <laughs> he did it all, pulled teeth, did medical work, chemist, <laughs> you name it, he tried it. Um, but above everything, he loved the people, he cared for them. And it shows in what happened because amongst this little group of students, particularly the Aboriginal students, there was some young men in particular and some girls as well, including his own <coughs> wife. He married a Yorta Yorta girl, uh, Ada Margaret, and uh, they had children. And uh, he began to prepare them for being leaders of their own people. He said, you can lead you can write your own appeals. And so he started a, a night school for adults. Uh, it became known as the Scholar's Hut. I like that. And uh, they would get together at night and he'd teach them basic skills. But more than anything, he taught them uh, how to stand up for themselves. Because he'd seen the Indian people in uh, Mauritius, where he came from, having to stand up to the colonial government and make appeals. And of course, it wasn't long before Mahatma Gandhi uh, was doing the same. So, um, out of his little school came William Cooper, who led the Aboriginal Progressive uh, Aboriginal Association in Melbourne, and he was their sort of very articulate leader. And he joined forces with Bill Ferguson here eventually in the 1930s. And uh, another famous figure. Douglas Nichols, who became pastor Sir Douglas Nichols and the governor of South Australia, and he and his wife have their statue in the grounds of Parliament House in Melbourne. Um, these became the leaders of the civil rights movement in Australia. So he was a sort of quiet subversionist, if you like, training these men to stand up for themselves. So when the government moved in and took their land away from them, it, because they'd been given some farms, he preached against it and he, he said to them, you've got to write and you've got to stand up for yourselves, which they did. So this quiet immigrant young bloke who'd come to Australia in 1880, in that 40 year period, he was training the men and women who were going to change uh, the future of Australia and particularly for the Aboriginal people. And I like that story. There was something <clears throat> of Jesus about that man. He followed Jesus and uh, he saw himself as a real leader of leaders, although he was quiet in himself. Doug Nichols said in, in the end, he said, you know, after Grandpa James, as they called him, died, he said, you know, he was a Gandhi for us Aboriginal people. He taught us passive resistance, just like Gandhi. He was ahead of his time. And uh, he gave us dignity, we sheltered under him. He was our mentor, our teacher, and we loved him. And everybody did, white, black, whoever, uh, loved Thomas Shadrach James. That's a great story. And behind here, you can see um, uh, William Cooper, William Cooper's friend, Bill Ferguson. Those two men stood up in Australia for civil rights. So. I thought you'd like to know that story. You can read more on uh, my website about it, uh, but check it out for yourself. It's one of our those invisible stories that's dropped out of sight. But I think it's one that we all should know, don't you? That's the story of Thomas Shadrach James, and I'm the Outback historian, Paul Rowe.